you hear me okay? Can I give a thumbs up? Okay. Is that okay? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Unisaku, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica, and uh, I'm an Unatsubu Inuk researcher. More specifically, my family are Pottles from the Wiglet area of Labrador, and I also have family in Carbonier on the island. But I was raised in Nikalawit Nunavut. So my interest in the Muscar Falls uh, issue stems from my community. Um, I was away at school because if you're from the north, there's not very many options to go to school at home. Um, and all of the kind of resistance was occurring and it was very um, emotional and inspiring for me to see my family be involved. And um, I, I am concerned. I'm concerned about my family's health in relation to methylmercury. Um, and I'm concerned about the community more generally. But today, I'll be talking about my recent work uh, for my master's on changing conceptions of health and resistance that took place in collaboration with the Labrador land protectors over the summer. I worked very closely with Denise. Um, this was my, for my master's in global health, and um, I hope to build on this throughout my upcoming PhD, which I've just started in sociology. So since my work with the Labrador land protectors, um, what, since my work was done with the Labrador land protectors, some of whom are here today, um, I'd like to invite them to chime in during the Q&A and they might be able to answer things better than me. <laughs> um, I'm very honored to present this work. Could you speak a little louder? Sure. Is that better? Okay. Um, since my work is very preliminary, I only submitted my dissertation a few weeks ago. I'd really appreciate any, attendance, uh, any uh, feedback or insights that anyone might have. So just to give a bit of a structure to this talk, I'll, I'll first talk about the background to my work, then go into my research approach, which uses indigenous <laughs> research methods. Um, then I'll describe what I did and how. And uh, finally, I'll discuss a few main issues that I heard from the land protectors, including concerns related to changing perceptions of health and safety, changing lifestyles. And since this panel is focusing on res resistance, um, Labrador resistance to the Muscarat Falls project as an unprecedented act of unity and rejection of Eurocentric institutions in this province and environmental concerns as a motivating factor for that unity. And since my focus is on health, health I'll discuss some potentially negative and um, even possibly some positive health impacts of participating in resistance as described to me by some of the land protectors that I spoke to. Um, the environment, both land and water, are well known to be central to Indigenous people's health. Thus, environmental destruction has a real impact on health and well-being. For example, disconnection from traditional territory has been found to lead to culture stress, uh, the destruction of family ties and degrading circumstances. And as I'm sure many of you know, um, Dr. Ashley Consola from the Labrador Institute has written brilliantly about the concept of ecological grief experienced by Inuit who cannot access the land prim primarily in the context of climate change, but I would argue that that could be broadened as well. Um, and as I'm sure many of you also know, traditional foods like caribou, whale, seal, fish, and birds provide unique social and cultural benefits. They've been found to contribute to indigenous people's identity, maintain community health by sharing and communal practices. So contamination of traditional food systems have a long history in, in Northern Canada. Um, for example, news of persistent organic pollutants in the 1960s worried some Inuit and led to some people moving away from a traditional diet towards one based on imported foods. And while contaminated food may affect the neuro neural behavioral system, development, immune system, and kidneys, uptake in a Western diet is associated with more immediate health effects, things like heart disease, diabetes, um, obesity, and tooth decay. So there's a very complicated and political negotiation that occurs when people decide what to eat or if they even have the, the choice to deci decide what to eat. Because I think that this decision gets more complicated when we include the reality of poverty and food insecurity. So this is the kind of type of background uh, that informs the work that I've done, and I hope to add some. Con uh, I hope it adds some context to what I'll be discussing next. This research is guided by an indigenous research methods approach. Um, indigenous research method is, is guided by principles of relationality and relational accountability. This is practiced through choosing what to research, how to do that research, how it's analyzed, and the presentation of findings. So for me, that meant choosing a topic that was important to me in my community doing what Wilson calls the ceremony of research, respectful data collection, analysis through relationship-based acknowledgement and presentation back to the people with whom I've worked, 
part of which is today. So since the topic of this panel is resistance, taking an Indigenous research methods approach is doubly empowering. It's an act of resistance toward, towards mainstream academia on behalf of the indigenous, indigenous researcher and an act of care and respect towards the Indigenous research participants and collaborators, which has often historically not been the case. In saying that, my personal goal for this work was to situate individual stories of protest in a larger context that could be used to spread awareness about the threats to health that my community faces. So I hope you'll forgive me for spending a significant amount of time speaking about what I did because I think it's central to the theme of resistance. So how did I do this? Um, I was in Goose Bay over the summer in June and July, during which I interviewed 13 <coughs> Labrador land protectors. Of these, 11 self-identified as Indigenous. In interviews, they explained to me how and why they became involved. They told me why the Muskrat Falls project was important to them, how it affected their life, and how they anticipated it affecting their life in, in the future. Um, participants were asked about any activities they participated in that could be affected and their overall experience of being a land protector. The option for names to be given was used in line with the Indigenous research methods uh, value of reciprocity and accountability since I do not claim ownership over people's stories and wanted to give people the option to be given credit for the knowledge that they shared with me. All participants, all participants except one asked that I use the name, so you will see some names. Um, we also held a sharing circle with the purpose of giving everyone in attendance the opportunity to speak and share uninterrupted. Um, after each interview and the sharing circle, a beaded sealskin pin made by me was given to each participant, uh, each person, so there's a photo there. Um, first, the materials have significance as seals are threatened by methylmercury contamination. The beads that were used to line the pin are the colors of the Labrador flag. Uh, and the practice of sewing and craft making is a strong Labrador and Indigenous tradition, including for many women in my family. Finally, beading, a repetitive action, allowed me the opportunity to reflect on the personal nature of the research and my gratitude for participants being willing to speak with me. Now, I'll briefly discuss the findings, the first two findings, since I want to dedicate more time towards the topic of resistance. It was repeatedly brought up to me that worries about mercury contamination, as well as fears about the North Spur breaking, have led people to fear for their health in a way they never did before. For example, Jim, who I'm sure uh, some of you know, told me, it's put what was a secure food supply in question. And that's a psychological factor that you now have to overcome. You either ignore it or try to tone down your expectations of the proteins you're getting from it. That becomes a question. So yes, that's the impact of that in my world. Changes your perception of the safety that was, is gone. I think that this is really telling in, in that it succinctly explains how long established beliefs about what's healthy and confidence in food sources is changing due to the Muskrat Falls project. I think this is worrying on mul multiple levels from a nutritional intake per perspective, but there are also believed to, to be physiological effects of distress, including between stress and depression and cardiovascular disease, upper respiratory tract uh, infections, asthma, autoimmune disease, and wound healing. I think these are important considerations for community health and well-being moving forward. Okay. The next issue I'd like to discuss is that of changing lifestyles, particularly changes associated with diet and food gathering. For Labradorians, concerns surrounding methylmercury cannot be separated from the food systems and food security. As Sam told me, I don't think I'll be eating much fish here. I'll do without. There's a somewhat counterintuitive relationship between country food and methylmercury. Traditional foods are important for physical health, as well as social, cultural, psychological, and spiritual reasons. The idea that something that was perceived as one of the healthiest things to consume could now be harmful is almost inconceivable, admittedly for me as well. Reclaiming or participating in cultural traditions can also be a protective factor for Indigenous health. This theme was highlighted by many participants who shared with me the benefits of a land-based lifestyle that incorporates their Labrador and or Indigenous cultures. Linda told me, and the thing about being able to go out on the land, to go out fishing or something, there's like a natural healing there. And being able to, you know, get away from the stress of work or home and you just get out there. Even if it's like 25 below and you go on the, out on the ice and fish, you feel that rejuvenation of health. This lifestyle described by Linda is under threat by the Muskrat Falls project and may have impacts on the benefits of interacting with the land, as well as the nutritional benefits of consuming traditional foods. 
This could result in increasing health inequalities in Gooseberry and Labrador more generally, particularly in the context of food insecurity in the region. So the Mutzkar Falls resistance was expressed to me as an unusual and unique occurrence. In saying this, I don't, I don't mean to imply that Labradorians are passive or submissive, as I was raised by a Labrador woman and I know this is not true. Um, but as Erin told me, the community did come together. And this was the first time I've ever seen a demonstration like this here in Labrador. Like everyone, all different nations all coming together as one, right? The Innu, the Inuit, and people from Southern Labrador. That's the first time I saw everyone coming together as one. During the most intense periods of resistance, I was told people came together as Labradorians rather than their specific cultural groups. And as another person told me, we had such a small group of people for so long, and finally Labradorians were all coming together. Inu, Inuit, you know, settler, everyone was coming together for the first time in Labrador history. This kind of unprecedented civic involvement was inspiring to many of the people that I spoke with, and as it was for me as I watched from afar, wishing that I could be there. So I think an obvious question that arises when we think about something being unpre unprecedented is why now? I think the historical and social context of Labrador can be helpful in understanding this. Public assistance in Labrador is a, a relatively new concept and in general, administrative policies have evolved to address the needs of people of European descent, not necessarily those of indigenous peoples, nor has much of the local cultural tradition been incorporated into policies. Eurocentric institutions, and by that I mean organizations such as the Newfoundland and Labrador government and the justice system, which are based on historically British institutions, inherently conflict with indigenous worldviews that shape Labradorians. As Batiste and Henderson write, Eurocentric consciousness treats the natural world as a practical source of means to achieve its own objectives. In contrast, indigenous peoples do not view humanity as separate from the natural world. This theme was repeated to me uh, by participants who affirm their relationship with the environment. Government administration and the justice system in the region remain largely, largely Eurocentric and inapplicable to, or even incompatible with, life in Labrador. As Eldred told me, you're made to feel that you don't count, that you're inferior. That's always been the situation with Labradorians anyways. The white man from offshore, he'll come and tell you what you gotta do and straighten you out and all that stuff, right? Keep things going the way they want it. And this is colonialism at its worst. So what's different about this situation? Um, I personally have a theory that I'm exploring that the motivation to go against social norms, to stand up and say, no, we don't want this, is the environment and what it facilitates for the community and the potential health impacts of a destructive environment. Cross-culturally, regardless of, of what group you come from, it provides food, cultural activities, spirituality, and so much more. As another participant told me, nobody here believes that the way they've built this dam is actually safe for the communities living downstream. And so we know that the North Square isn't safe. And then we have methyl mercury that's destroying this, you know, this culture, this beautiful Inuit culture, Inu culture, Labrador culture, you know? People told me that Labrador is its environment, that when they think of Labrador, they think of nature and that the land is of central importance to the region. Therefore, the destruction of the environment is a direct threat to Labrador as a whole. And I think perhaps this is why people came together in this instance. Um, I am particularly, particularly interested in understanding how participating in resistance impacts health, as it was expressed to me as an all-consuming activity. Narratives about lack of consultation and silencing by government officials and organizations that were prominent and, shape, uh, were prominent and shaped people's experiences of resisting and the Muscat Falls project. On an individual level, there are health impacts of the perception of being ignored by the government and silenced by the justice system. Some people told me they experienced stress due to their interactions with the police and court. Roberta mentioned to me how this powerlessness influences health and well-being. I don't think it's healthy for us to all feel like we're being stepped on all the time. I don't think it's healthy for us to have no say in anything that goes on in our home, the place we care about. I agree. And this is backed up by existing literature on how politics influence health. Feeling ignored by the government can affect psychosocial health. And the socioeconomic position may also be affected by people not being able to afford, or people not being afforded the same economic, economic opportunities as those with more power and influence. Next slide. Um, many people spoke about the health impacts of being a Labrador land protector, including the stress of participation, of being arrested, of strained relationships. Um, but 
to end on perhaps a slightly more optimistic note, it was also expressed to me that the community of land protectors is supportive and provides purpose. Denise told me, knowing I'm walking a good path, it does, it helps. And Marjorie said, but how do I say this? The stay in jail itself was not traumatic for me at all and anywhere near that. And I knew I had to do this. I had to make this statement that I would stay here in jail to make my point. And I felt empowered by that, I suppose, all the way through. I suspect that despite the negative reasons for having to participate in resistance, that participating may impact, pers may maintain personal health as it's representative of the <laughs> reciprocal relationship between the environment's health and the health of human beings. So thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to answering any questions and learning from your insights.